first, I'd like to note uh, that we will be recording this presentation for future use. So please act accordingly. Uh, next for the best viewing experience, go to the upper right hand corner of your Zoom screen and uh, make sure that you are in presenter or speaker view as opposed to gallery view. Also, it's worth noting that you are currently defaulted on mute and it would be great if you would stay that way during the duration of the presentation, but that your camera may still be live. So please adjust your video settings to what you are most comfortable with. You can adjust your video settings by clicking the video camera button on the toolbar. Finally, I want to mention that our speaker will take some time to answer your questions at the end of their presentation, but that you can type a question at any point during the presentation using the chat function. You can find the chat function on the toolbar under the more button. At the appropriate time, I will monitor off to Becca. Now, for those of you who don't know, my name is Daniel Center, and I am the Community Conservation Coordinator for the Methow Conservancy. We are a nonprofit land trust and environmental education organization whose mission is to inspire people to care for the land of the Methow Valley. If you like what you see here tonight, I encourage you to visit our website, methowconservancy.org, for information on upcoming events like our March Conservation Course that will focus on how underrepresented peoples and communities shape the past, present, and future of the Methow Valley. Now, at this point, it is important for us to pause and reflect on the fact that the Methow Conservancy and Predator Prey Project do our work on the traditional homelands of the Okanagan, Methow, Sandpoil, Colville, and Duwamish people. And as the rain from the past couple days has wash, washed away the mask of winter, I have been noticing an incredible amount of scat on the roads that I regularly run. Normally at this time of year, they would be hidden beneath layer upon layer of snow and ice. These scats, mostly coyote, tell a story of an individual, a pack, a population, and a valley that is in the midst of a pretty major ecological change. In 2008, in the hills above Twisp, the first wolf since their extirpation in Washington state was seen by a local Forest Service biologist. Since then, wolves have been steadily recolonizing the state. As they do, they have been disrupting the makeshift ecosystem that is formed in their absence. Our speaker, Becca Wendell, is a research scientist for University of Washington's Pru Lab. This lab, along with Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, are principal partners in what has been named the Predator Prey Project. For the past five years, this project has been thoroughly investigating the story of the return of the wolf to Washington State. Becca's chapter in that story involves bobcats and coyotes and their new relationship to this larger predator. In addition to her great work, Becca, along with her husband, have just moved to the valley full time. And I can already tell from seeing Becca's dedication to wildlife and passion for people that she is going to be an important presence in this community for years to come. So without further ado, let's give a warm Metau welcome to Becca Wendell. Daniel, thanks so much. That was, uh, or yeah, those super kind words. And um, yeah, I guess, hello and welcome everybody. Um, again, my name is Becca Wendell um, and I'm gonna share my screen real quick before I forget to do that. Um, all right, so i um, super excited to be here a bit uh, today to tell you a bit about uh, the meso carnivore work that we are doing here in the valley. Um, before I get going, though, I do want to thank the Met Howe Conservancy 
for invite, inviting me here today. Um, I'm a big fan of the work that the Conservancy does um, to advance both conservation and agriculture in the Valley. And uh, so, yeah, it's just an honor to be here giving this talk today. Um, so I'm going to start by uh, just giving you a little overview of what we'll talk about today. Uh, and this will kind of fall into three broad categories. So to start, I'll just give you an uh, overview of our project, a little bit about its inception, and then the various components of the project. From there, I'll dive deeper into the music carnivore fieldwork that we're conducting right now. Uh, and then third, gonna talk about a really exciting community science partnership between the University of Washington and the Matt Howe Conservancy um, and different ways that you can get involved with the project if you so desire. So starting with our project overview, um, as Daniel was mentioning, um, our story kind of begins uh, here in the 1930s. Um, the history of wolves in Washington is probably familiar to most of you, um, but it was in 1930 that wolves were extirpated or uh, went locally extinct here in Washington state uh, after years of intense and targeted persecution. So fast forward though to 2008, and uh, after a nearly 80 year absence, wolves began to recolonize Washington. And the first documented wolf pack uh, established here in the Met Howe and was named after Lookout Mountain, um, where this lovely lookout tower uh, resides as well. So since 2008, the number of wolves have been steadily increasing across the state. And as a result in 2015, the Washington State Legislature mandated a study of potential ecological impacts of these recolonizing wolves on ungulate populations in the state. Um, and so as a result, the Washington Predator Prey Project was born um, and has been collecting data to investigate this question over the past five years. Uh, the West Washington Predator Prey Project is a partnership between the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife and the University of Washington, where research scientists uh, DFW research scientists Malia DeVivo and Brian Kirsten have been really critical in helping uh, with all aspects of our project. In addition, I do want to acknowledge some really extra special support that we've gotten from other folks in Okanagan, including Scott Ficken, John, Jeff Heinlein, John Rohr, Brendan Toyer, and Jim Olson, um, who have all provided tons of logistical uh, assistance as we've gone about our project. So anchoring back to the state legislature's mandate to uh, uh, the project is broken up into five different core components to study interactions between not only wolves and ungulates, but also other carnivore species across the state. First part of the project is focused on uh, specifically looking at carnivore ungulate interactions. This part of the project is led by Laura Pru and Taylor Gans, and they're looking at impacts of wolves on mule deer, white-tailed deer, and elk. Uh, they're monitoring both the survival and movements of these ungulates using GPS and radio tracking devices uh, for the most part. Next big component of our study is looking at cougar wolf interactions. Aaron Worsing and Lauren Satterfield are leading this part of the project. And I'm sure uh, many of you have tuned in to some of these previous first Tuesdays have heard Lauren talk about her work um, so essentially she's using GPS collars and remote wildlife camera traps to track cougar and wolf movements, behaviors, and interactions across the landscape. The next part of our project uh, is led by Beth Gardner and Sarah Bassing, and they're looking at broad scale community dynamics uh, between both predator and prey populations across the state. Um, they're doing this using an extensive network of wildlife camera traps to investigate both spatial and temporal patterns of predator prey interactions and community dynamics. Uh, next, there uh, is a non-invasive wolf monitoring component to the study. So this is again led by Beth Gardner and her student Trent Rousen, who's also a biologist with DFW. And they are doing some really neat work developing acoustic monitoring techniques that record and track wolf howls across the landscape, non-invasively monitor wolves. Um, in addition to looking at factors influencing wolf color recolonization across the state. And so then finally, um, this brings us to the final fifth component of our study, which is looking at interactions between apex and mesocarnivores. Um, to note that this part of the study is specifically funded by the National Science Foundation as well, and it's led by Laura Pru and myself. Here, we're looking at the movement, behavior, and population dynamics of mesocarnivores, specifically our focal species, our coyotes and bobcats, 
and we're looking at their responses uh, as a, uh, in response to apex predators, so the larger carnivores on the, the landscape, uh, wolves and cougars specifically. So mesocarnivores is a word that I'll be throwing around a lot during this presentation. Um, and essentially it just refers to these mid-sized carnivores. So Washington Predator Prey Project is being conducted across two study areas that are delineated here in this map by the green polygons. Um, our Northeast study area is centered around the town of Chewila, Washington, and our Okanagan study area is centered around Winthrop and includes much of the Metha Valley. The study areas are both similar in size, about 10,000 square kilometers each. And as you can see, the orange polygons here, um, which are wolf packs across the state, uh, vary quite a bit where wolf densities in the Northeast are a bit higher than here in Okanagan. And so although we're doing this work in these two study areas, most of what I'm going to be talking about today is the work that we're doing in the Okanagan study area since it's uh, where we all are right now. Okay, so um, with that background in mind, I'll dive into uh, the data we're collecting for our mesocarnivore work. So this study is still ongoing. Um, and as a result, I don't unfortunately have a ton of results to share, um, but really excited to introduce you to the questions that we're looking at and the various methods that we're using to look at these questions. Um, before I dive into the specifics of our field work, however, I do wanna acknowledge our crews that make this work happen. Um, we've had quite a few biologists join us over the years. Um, and here I've highlighted the names of our, our winter 2021 crew in yellow. Um, also want to give a really special shout out to Carmen Van Bianchi and Anna Makowitz, who um, are two incredible field biologists that are uh, local to the Met How, have been working on this project since its inception, and are currently leading our crews in the Okanagan and Northeast, respectively. And so, um, as you might have noticed, our crews are fairly small and everyone is working super hard in all sorts of adverse conditions on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, as Anna here is demonstrating though, sometimes the, the going can get pretty rough, um, particularly in sloppy snow conditions like we have right now. Um, so again, huge thanks to all their hard work. And uh, yeah, just for a bit of context here, this is a snowmobile that tipped in some nasty slush and um, it's no snow, small feat to get it back up. Um, as these machines weigh somewhere in the ballpark of 500 pounds. Uh, so yeah, we'll, we'll wish Anna good luck getting this up from here. Um, all right, so getting back to the goals of our project, the central question that we're investigating is this, do apex predators facilitate or suppress mesocarnivore populations? So to break this down a bit, we essentially have two hypotheses that we're testing about the importance of ungulate carrion, or in other words, dead deer, elk, meat on mesocarnivore populations and behavior. So starting with, uh, so starting state for both of our hypotheses is that we have an ungulate carcass killed by a wolf or cougar or some other way that is represented here by um, this deer with a red X. Um, so our first hypothesis is that ungulate carrion is a really important source of essentially free food that can bolster mesocarnivore populations. And so by having this carrion on the landscape, it can increase the number of bobcats and coyotes. On the other hand, these carcasses might serve as hotspots for interactions between carnivores and increase coyote and bobcats risk of getting killed by large carnivores like cougars and wolves. Um, so that ultimately carrion ends up suppressing, this carrion is available, ends up suppressing these carnivore populations as carcasses serve um, as a source of this sort of like fatal attraction. Um, so in 2020, um, the PI on this project, Laura Peru and Kelly Sivy, published a review that started to look at this question on a global scale. So they summarized uh, data on interactions between carnivores across the world, and they found a few really interesting things. Um, first and foremost, large carnivore, they found that large carnivores were responsible for about a third of all mesocarnivore mortalities. Um, second, mesocarnivore mortality increases from about 10 to 25% in systems with two versus three carnivores. So in the context of our study, this is interesting because we're kind of going from uh, one large carnivore to two large carnivore systems by adding in wolves. Uh, third, 
Scavenged ungulates comprised about 30% of mesocarnivore diets. Uh, and then fourth, a couple, uh, fourth and fifth, a couple really specific interactions relative to whether the large carnivore was painted uh, or like a dog-like animal or a cat-like animal. So essentially finding here was that large canids uh, like wolves were far more likely to kill smaller canids like coyotes than they were to kill carnivores from other families such as the bobcats. On the other hand, large felids uh, like cougars were found to be a bit more equal opportunistic killers. Uh, yeah, not really discriminating between killing coyotes or bobcats. So in this study that we're doing here, we're investigating whether these patterns hold true on a local scale here in Washington. So first, um, we're going to, uh, so I guess from there, I want to, there's three primary, uh, I guess with, with those overarching questions in mind, um, we're collecting data using three primary methods. First is GPS collaring. Um, next, we're deploying cameras at carcass sites. And third, we're doing uh, really fancy high-tech poop science. Uh, so starting with our GPS collaring efforts, um, this essentially allows us to track coyotes and bobcats and their movements and behavior so we can tell how these animals are using the landscape. So how we do this, um, get this video rolling, is first and foremost, we need to capture our animals. So this is one of our bobcat traps that we set. Um, you'll see first, hopefully this like CD that's oddly hanging um, from a tree. This is a, a form of eye catch. Um, cats in particular will are attracted to sort of flashy things. So that CD is there to, to catch them from afar. And then next within that, the actual trap, we've baited it with some nice tasty morsels and really just stinky foul things as well to try to lure them into the trap. Um, and then in that trap, there's a little treadle that uh, eventually as the animals poke it around there, once he steps on it, the gate will close like it just did. And um, now we have a bobcat waiting for us um, to be processed. And you'll see the boughs around that trap there to both hide it and keep the animal warm um, until we arrive. Okay, so after we capture animals, we immobilize them with a specially formulated drug so that we can safely gather information like sex, age, and body condition and put these GPS collars that you can see over here in the right hand side um, on them. So our bobcat collars weigh about seven ounces and they work by sending us GPS points um, to basically just locations of where that animal is every four hours so that we can track our animal's movements. Um, and then that can give us insight into how they're using the land to interact with other species. So, um, this is a little bit of preliminary data that we have from our project. Uh, so you'll see over here in the left-hand side of the corner, all of these blue blobs are uh, the area that our colored bobcats use. So we have 19 different bobcats that we've colored across our Okanagan study area. Um, on the right-hand side are blobs that represent the 18 colored coyotes that we have here in the Okanagan. Um, including these two white blobs, which are sort of approximated ranges for two animals that we have in the Libby Creek area, um, but aren't sending data right now. It's a, a bit of a Bermuda Triangle down there at the moment. Um, so kind of as you're looking at these two different maps, one important thing to note between coyote and bobcats is that we have a lot more transient or really wandering bobcats um, in comparison to coyotes that have these like smaller, tighter territories or home ranges that they use. Um, so yeah, for example, just want to point out too, it's a little hard to see, but there's this one giant blob that belongs to one of our, our cats who has essentially taken an entire tour of the Met How um, in the last couple of years that he's been on air with us. So uh, one other thing to note is though, when you remove these sort of wandering transient bobcats uh, and look just at the resident bobcats that have really tight areas that they're using on a regular basis. Um, you'll note that bobcats are using more space overall than coyotes. Um, so our coyotes right now, uh, the average home range or territory size is about 10 square miles. 
um, that ranges a fair amount, somewhere between four and 18 square miles. Um, in comparison to our bobcats, our resident bobcats that have an average about 50 square mile home range, um, and that, that has been ranging from about 30 to 75 square miles um, for bobcats here in, in our economic study area. And yeah, it's just a really good comparison is this, I don't know if you can see my arrow, but just in the far right, bottom right hand corner of the map, um, we have a, a bobcat home range that's overlaid. They're using the same area, but bobcats using quite a bit more area than that guy out there. Okay, so down the road, um, we'll be using data from these GPS collars to look at patterns of avoidance and attraction between carnivore species, um, specifically between our meso carnivores and cougars and wolves, and then also um, locations where we have found carrion on the landscape. Uh, and in addition to this, we'll be looking at changes in space use due to fire, um, particularly here in the Okanagan where we've had uh, really um, incredible fire patterns the past you know, several years to, yeah, even into the, the last couple of decades. Um, another thing they'll be looking at is space use changes um, in relationship to timber harvest patterns, which are really variable in our Northeast study area. And then we'll also be looking at um, how space use and patterns of movement might be changing in response to changing snow conditions. All right, so next big focus of our data collection effort is to investigate scavenging activity um, by deploying wildlife camera traps at ungulate uh, carcass sites. So we deploy wildlife cameras like the one that you can see here in the right hand side of the screen um, that use motion sensors uh, to detect movement and therefore animals. And these allow us to non-invasively observe wildlife behavior at ungulus at ungulate carcasses that we find using five different primary techniques. So for both cougar and wolf clusters, we rely on GPS data from our collared cougars and wolves that are parts of other components of the project to find feeding sites. Um, so essentially these will show up as uh, anytime we find multiple locations in any one area or one sort of buffered perimeter, um, we'll go in there to see if we um, can find a carcass, because it might indicate a feeding site. Um, in addition, anytime one of our colored deer or elk in Taylor's part of the project, the eyes will deploy cameras on those carcasses. And finally, we also set up cameras on carcasses that we find opportunistically as we go about our day-to-day -day activities, um, and also on road-killed animals. So we're going to clusters of colored wolf and cougar activity. Um, and sometimes we're finding places where animals have simply settled in for a nap. Um, and occasionally we'll, we'll find that they like to nap uh, since in areas with some stunning views, uh, such as the one that Carmen is showing off here. Uh, other times, however, we're finding ungulate carcasses, um, and in which case we're set up cameras to document who comes by. So at these cameras, we'll see a variety of animals such as this cougar who visited the carcass shortly after we set up the camera. And then from there, we'll get uh, all sorts of other images that can help us understand how much carrion scavengers like this coyote are making off with, uh, or give us some insight into the fate of some of our colored animals, like this bobcat, uh, which is 11M, who was found killed by another predator shortly after this photo of him scavenging at an ungulate carcass was taken. And then finally, these images can also give us insight into how animals are interacting at carcass sites, uh, such as this photo where one of our colored bobcats and a coyote were vying for the same carcass. All right, so then finally, the other key part of our project is to investigate coyote and bobcat population dynamics using fecal genotyping, or in other words, poop science. Um, so when you heard the words population dynamics, uh, Poop science is probably not the first thing that came to mind, but it's the primary way that we're able to understand how coyote and bobcat densities vary um, in areas both with and without wolf presence. So how this works is that every time um, an animal poops, as they are here in these photos, um, as it's defecating, cells lining their intestines will slough off and can be found along the surfaces of scalp. Um, 
Well, so what we do then is collect these scats and send them back to the shared genetics lab at uh, University of Washington, where each scat is then swabbed in the lab um, to look for a genetic fingerprint that can give us a whole bunch of uh, really neat information about the animal. For one, um, we'll identify our scats to species in the field using morphological characteristics. Um, so for example, here on the left-hand side of the screen is a bobcat scat. There's some key indicators that can help us uh, help us to determine that it's a bobcat scat, such as these little like segmented bits that kind of look like tater tots um, with nice blunt edges. Um, in contrast to over on the right-hand side, this coyote scat that's a lot more continuous in nature and has these really distinct tapered pointed ends. Um, so anywho, uh, sometimes these characteristics can, we'll, we'll use them to make our assessment, um, but sometimes these characteristics aren't super clear. Uh, for instance, if an animal has diarrhea, and in these cases in particular, genetics can be used first and foremost to confirm species ID. Um, in addition to that, however, we can also determine the individual animal that, that left that scat uh, along the, uh, along the landscape. So whether it was like Bob or Sue that pooped, um, we can tell the sex of the animal and then also how related that animal is to other coyotes and bobcats in the population. So then with these IDs in hand, along with information where about where the animal has pooped on the landscape, um, that then allows us to count the number of coyotes and bobcats in a given area and estimate densities. So as our field crew go about their day-to-day -day activities, We'll collect scat that we find opportunistically. Um, and then along a set of transects, which you can see here in this map, um, are these red lines. So real challenge here is that our crews, again, are pretty small and we have a lot of ground to cover in each of our study areas um, because they're so large. So this means that we're generally limited co to collecting scats along roadways um, that we can travel efficiently using either a truck or a snowmobile. Um, but this, means that we're unable to sample some other really critical areas uh, and travel corridors, such as trails, decommissioned roads, that coyotes and bobcats are regularly traveling. So this leads me then into the final and most exciting part, in my opinion, of tonight's talk, um, which is the community science partnership um, that our project has formed with the Met Howe Conservancy. So this January, Stanley and I have trained an amazing group of more than 30 volunteers who are now collecting scat on 31 additional transects across our Okanagan study area. Volunteers are collecting scat uh, in January, February, and March of this year um, on sets of two to seven mile hike, ski, and snowshoe routes. So the locations of our community science routes can be seen here by these blue pins. And the addition of these routes has allowed us to sample nearly 150 miles of additional ground. Um, so really grateful to everyone that has volunteered their time to help us make this project, uh, to help with this project. And um, happy to report too that our, in the first couple of weeks of our uh, scat collection, our volunteers have collected more than 30 scats already, um, which is awesome. Uh, and then there just wanted to make a quick plug to keep an eye out on upcoming backyard bulletins and newsletters coming from the Conservancy um, for scat route opportunities uh, with Daniel and Johnny uh, at Paragon Lake, Paragon Lake, Big Valley, and South Summit up at Loop Loop um, in the next couple months. So then finally, we have two additional side projects that are related to our meso carnivore field work that I wanted to introduce folks to. The first is uh, a coyote den work project that we're interested in, uh, this question of compensatory reproduction. So in a nutshell, there's this interesting, pretty well-documented phenomenon in coyotes where litter size is actually increased when they are heavily persecuted by humans um, and densities are low. So we're really curious to see if this holds true in the face of wolf persecution as well. Um, so thus, we're looking for coyote den sites um, in the throughout the valley where we can deploy remote wildlife camera traps and get images uh, like you can see here in the right hand side of the screen to monitor dens and, and count the number of pups that litters will have. So um, another plug, but if you happen to know of any den sites, 
uh, that coyotes have used in the past. Um, would love to get in touch and hear from you to see if we can uh, put up a camera before the denning season starts in, in early March. Um, and then the last project that I wanna put on everybody's radar and that we're just getting started this winter is a new NASA funded study looking at how changing snow conditions influence predator prey interactions. So Ben Sullender, who you can see here in the middle sandwiched between Anna and Carmen um, is working with our MUSO crew this winter to do some pilot work measuring specific snow characteristics like density and hardness um, and we'll be starting a PhD project next fall to start investigating these really cool and complex snow wildlife dynamics um, in an ever-changing winter, winter climate. Um, so with that, I want to say thank you to everybody. Um, yeah, so quick and dirty overview of our project and uh, happy to take any questions that folks might have. Becca, thank you so much. That was really fun and informative and we really appreciate you uh, engaging this community uh, in this massive science project. And it sounds like our volunteers will really be able to help you guys uh, collect a ton of new data, which is awesome. 100%. And yeah, I just wanted to note too, I saw lots of volunteers names as we were, we were starting the, the Zoom. So really great to see everybody here. Yeah. Are you ready to answer a couple questions? I am. Okay. Um, starting off, I think somebody is interested in, in how wolves kind of started to recolonize Washington state. Um, it's my understanding they moved back into the state from nearby populations um, on their own. Is that correct? Yeah. So the first wolves that moved into Washington state, um, so the ones that started the lookout pack, um, came from British Columbia. And then um, in the northeast part of the state, wolves have also come over from Idaho, Montana populations. But yeah, uh, wolves have been steadily increasing, coming naturally into uh, Washington state. There hasn't been any um, active reintroduction efforts. It's all just been natural recolonization. Great. Okay. Um, somebody noticed on your range map of the coyotes and bobcats um, that those ranges really didn't include the valley floor. Do you guys have any uh, data points or hypotheses as to why these animals don't really use the valley floor? Yeah, I mean, that's definitely, we've been trying to strategically, and I could go back to that slide. Um, we've been trying to strategically put those collars out because we are really interested in um, interactions between our meso carnivores and the larger carnivores on the landscape. We are uh, trying to put them out in areas where we, well, we've been trying to distribute them throughout the study area as much as possible, but also making sure if we can to have them overlap with um, collared wolves and cougars as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, with the wolves in particular, they're never really coming down to the, the valley floor, just pretty shy around humans. Um, and so that's why we've kind of shifted our home ranges up that, that way as well. Um, there'd be other really cool questions that would relate specifically to how coyotes and bobcats might be interacting with people too. And um, yeah, that, that would probably look pretty different. So uh, just kind of the focus of our study is the reason we shifted them up into the hills for the most part. Okay, makes sense. Um, I know you guys are still in the data collection phase, but what can you tell us about um, the way bobcats and coyotes interact with each other? And do you guys know anything about that relationship? Yeah, I mean, don't have any like really great solid results, um, but just like anecdotally, um, they're definitely using the same area. Um, we, as we're going about our, our day to day, um, I think some, yeah, just ways that we know that the two animals are crossing paths. For, for instance, um, not too long ago, I was out walking around, um, going to a cluster site and um, yeah, had passed an area, came back and there was both a, a new fresh set of coyote tracks 
a new fresh set of bobcat tracks that had intersected and both uh, one animal defecated and one had overmarked. Um, so they're, they're definitely playing territorial games out there often. Um, and then, I mean, we haven't found a lot of instances of this, but um, this was a pretty interesting uh, photo that we captured at one of our carcass sites too, the one over here on the far right, uh, where these animals are actively interacting sometimes, particularly at these, these food resource sites. Very cool. Um, um, do you know if there are any studies that you know of that have looked at uh, how wolves or coyotes um, interact with uh, cattle on public lands or free range cattle? Yeah, um, there's been, I can't say anything off the top of my head, but obviously like conflict between both coyotes, wolves, all carnivores and livestock is um, at the forefront of, um, yeah, need of conservation, just making sure that there's a level of coexistence. Um, so specifically, there's a lot of different studies out, out there looking at, um, for instance, non-lethal tools that can be used to try to mitigate interactions between our coyote, uh, between carnivores and livestock. Um, there are studies looking at different landscape features that might um, promote, uh, yeah, or just encourage interactions. Um, yeah, pretty wide, wide range of, of literature, depending on, on what folks are specifically interested in between, um, yeah, carnivore livestock interactions. Okay, sounds like there's a lot to dive into there. Um, yeah, and I, I'd be happy to like, folks have something specific, uh, send along a few things. Okay. Um, I don't know if you can share this, but kind of approximately how many coyote dens have you guys located uh, in, in the Methauer of Okanagan County? Yeah, so that's something we're just getting started um, with. We have gone to, I might have the number a little off, but we've only gone to five or so dens in, um, in the Okanagan so far. Uh, last year we had some grand plans to go to more dens and then COVID hit right during denning season. Um, but we are using our colored animals to again, like find areas where a lot of points are being laid down on the landscape, which can help us to locate those den sites. Um, but we're really interested in putting up uh, cameras before the denning happens too, because coyotes in particular are such uh, wary animals that if, if anything changes, on the landscape, they're quick to notice. So if we can get a camera up before they even arrive and are a bit more used to it, the odds of them using that den are, are higher. Okay. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and answer one of these questions. Somebody asked, are more volunteers uh, needed at this time? And those folks with individual routes, uh, we have enough volunteers on, but I, am leading some outings uh, each month uh, in February and March. So if you wanna look in e-news or the Backyard Bulletin, we'll have some opportunity for folks to get out and do some SCAT data collection. So look for those opportunities. Um, and then Becca, this is an interesting question. Have you guys noticed any differences um, between the Northeast and Okanagan mesocarnivore? Uh, slash apex predator populations? Yeah, again, I wish I had some like more detailed definitive um, insights. Interestingly, like the reason, part of the reason we chose these two study areas is that in, in many ways they are geographically, like topographically similar. So um, both the, the Northeast and the Okanagan study area are kind of centered along these larger valleys that have a lot of residential and agricultural development um, and then kind of hills, forested hills off to the east and west. Um, yeah, I mean, big differences that I can just cite off the bat, however, are that here in the Okanagan, there's a lot more public land um, in comparison to the northeast where we're using, um, we're needing to do our work on a lot more private lands because um, there's a lot of really like vast timber, privately held timberlands out there, um, which actually are kind of interesting little 
um, wild like really great hot spots of wildlife um, activity. So yeah, I don't have anything definitive, but um, looking forward to, to digging into that more. Yeah, that would be interesting to hear about how um, land use really affects the movement and behavior of these animals. Um, somebody wants to know kind of what level of detail you guys can get from the DNA in these scat yeah. samples. And they're curious if uh, you guys can tell if there's been inbreeding or yeah, just what level of information you can get from these samples. Yeah, the inbreeding question, I'd have to talk to Ellie Reese, who is our genetics lab guru. Um, but I mean, we it is like quite, we're, we're based, we really are getting like a, a DNA fingerprint from each animal from these scats. So again, like the, the cells fluff off along the outsides of those scats. Um, each of those cells basically then contains DNA, which can, you know, tell us everything about that animal. Um, so it is quite detailed information um, in terms of, yeah, just knowing exactly who it is um, and then how related they are to others in the population where I imagine uh, could get at inbreeding as well. Uh, but yeah, I'd have to ask Ellie specifically. It's a great question. Okay. Yeah, but also maybe um, just one more uh, comment on that too. Like a neat thing about genetics is that uh, I mean, I, I know it very surface level, but it's a rapidly growing field. So there's a lot of really neat, um, neat things coming in terms of non-invasively monitoring animals um, where that DNA can now be gotten from things like uh, footprints in the snow too. Um, so yeah, it, it's kind of incredible. And with these data sets, as there are new tools coming available, you guys will probably be able to answer new questions as new techniques arise. Definitely. Yeah, and I think the real benefit too is, is being able to move more and more towards um, these non-invasive methods to monitor populations <laughs> of wildlife as well. Because um, obviously we're like in our capture efforts, we're taking our as best as we can um, but it's a pretty limited number of animals that we're able to handle. Um, and yeah, it's just pretty like invasive process. So um, yeah, all of the new like non-invasive techniques are really exciting. Great. Um, a little bit just about um, kind of carnivore behavior. Somebody asks if coyotes, bobcats, cougars, and wolves are nocturnal. Yeah, so particularly all of the carnivores, I'd say like lean more towards something called crepuscular. So being uh, mostly active dawn and dusk times. Um, but a really interesting thing about carnivores and many other different wildlife species is that um, depending on their circumstance, they can, can alter their behavior. Uh, coyotes in particular are such incredible um, flexible little animals. So yeah, they'll oftentimes um, when sharing the landscape with humans, for instance, um, activity patterns will shift to be more nocturnal, for instance, so that they can avoid, um, yeah, crossing paths with humans, which are more diurnal by nature. Interesting. Um, again, on kind of the behavior topic, have there been any hypotheses about how cougars and uh, scavengers might change their um, kind of habits around eating uh, due to the presence of wolves and specifically maybe like cougars burying their kills? Yeah, that'll be a great question for Lauren down the line. Um, she's looking really specifically at those wolf cougar interactions. Um, cougars will definitely uh, cache or like kind of bury their their carcasses, I think with or without wolves on the landscape. Um, I think there's a variety of reasons for that. Uh, just like reducing smell and decay and all that. Um, yeah, so Lauren Saddlefield will hopefully have some cool information on that um, coming soon. Great. Yeah. Um, somebody asks if 
when you are attaching GPS to coyotes, are you using soft leg traps or what methods? Yeah, so we use um, foothold traps with a, a rubber, um, kind of rubber plate in the middle of the, the trap to, uh, yeah, try to minimize any sort of in injury. Uh, I wish coyotes would walk into a box trap like our bobcats will. Um, so yeah, right now that's our, our primary method of coyote capture. Great. Um, somebody asks what the average height and length of a bobcat is. Oh gosh, that's a great question. Um, I don't have numbers off the top of my head, <laughs> but um, yeah, I guess like for a little bit of reference, I suppose I have a 45 kind of standard little cattle dog and um, the, our bobcats and coyotes are quite a bit skinnier, but um, similarly sized height and length, maybe just a little bit smaller. So I don't know, for those who have a 45 pound reference dog, <laughs> shrinking that down just a little bit. <laughs> um, do wolverines or lynxes ever visit these kill sites that you guys have cameras on? Yeah, we have not detected um, a lynx or a wolverine at um, any of the image at any of the carcass uh, purposes cameras that we've put out so far. That being said, I have we're actively going through those images. We have a whole bunch of really awesome dedicated volunteers um, under or undergrad interns and volunteers at the university that are going through images. So we haven't gone through everything. It's uh, not out of the realm of possibility. Um, I think Wolverines would be a little bit. I would be really surprised if we found a wolverine on our camera just because of like elevation gradient wise where we're deploying these cameras. Um, but I think links could be possible. Nice. And it's in a similar vein, um, what about black bears? Yeah, black bears are active players. Um, obviously not right now during the winter, um, but summer, they're another key player at these carcasses. Um, and again, that's something that uh, Lauren is digging into a little bit uh, and we'll have some I think, cool information about that that's forthcoming. Very cool. Um, can you tell us a little bit about kind of the future timing of the project and like how much longer you guys are gonna be collecting data and then what might happen after that? Yeah. So this is our final big year of data collection. Um, so we're kind of wrapping things up this year, at least in terms of the core meso carnivore um, goals that I went over. Uh, that snow wildlife project will just be starting up. But yeah, um, kind of wrapping up all the field work, which is um, exciting to then start to shift gears to start processing the large amounts of data that we've collected over the last several years. And um, yeah, I guess timeline will take us a little while to get through that, but really, really excited to um, share our findings in the coming years um, with everybody. Great, and folks are asking too about, you made a call for locations on den sites and um, they're just asking how to do that. And maybe in a future e-newsletter, um, we can kind of write up how we'd like folks to uh, give you information on den locations. That sounds great. Okay. Yeah, so and just tuned. a couple more. Yeah, stay tuned. Um, maybe our final question here. What are you looking forward to most about living in the Met How full time? Oh, man. Uh, well, I'm an avid runner. Uh, apart from like wildlife and running are kind of my two things that I really love. So uh, <laughs> yeah, just really excited to ramble in the mountains. And um, yeah, also just, this is a little bit tangential, but really excited to be more and more part of this community here in the Maha. It's just really incredible. Um, it was such a pleasure meeting everybody um, during our SCAT trainings and yeah, just incredible group of people here and excited to um, yeah, I get to know everybody. 
Well, similarly, we're really looking forward to getting to know you and your husband. So welcome. Thanks. And I think, yeah, I think that'll conclude it, folks. Um, thanks for tuning in. And if you have any more questions, uh, you can email me at daniel at medhowconservancy.org and stay tuned uh, for more information in our e-newsletter and backyard bulletin. Thanks for joining. Thanks, everybody.